not be thwarted by any enemy. And Lord, for those who are coming against her, we speak confusion into the camp of those enemies in Jesus' name. And we bind the hand of Satan in Jesus' name. And we pray your blessings upon Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to see everybody here this morning. Hope that uh, this has found you uh, in a place where you're ready to worship, right? And uh, I kind of kind of told people this week, you know, as hot as it's been, and like it's kind of an evangelistic goal, right? <laughs> and if you don't like it this hot, you need to get right with Jesus, right? You know what I mean? We just need, yeah. So I, I just ask that you know, why don't you guys go ahead and stand? Man, I, you know, there is a, there's a, there's a pressing in. I feel like the Lord wants us to do today, and we're gonna, we're gonna sing some songs. They are, you know, there's a couple of them here that are, that are give us opportunities to celebrate and to be a, you know, be able to communicate our heart to the Lord. And I'm, I'm gonna encourage you this. As, as we enter in, don't, don't be afraid of those places. Don't be afraid of those quiet places. And let's just hear from the Spirit together and, uh, and see what He says. And it may be different for each and every one of us in the room. He's that good, right? And, uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, but we're going to enter in together and uh, ask Him to just reveal His heart to us today. All right? Is everybody in? All right, yeah, let's go again.
Yes. But through his belief, through Amen. his faith. Thank you, Lord. To see. Thank and that was his prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. On earth as it is in heaven. So what what's it like in heaven? That's what he wants to bring to earth. Through you and I. And it's only made possible by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. 
and then, okay, there we go. Alright, as I was worshiping, I just, I saw this picture. I was, I was stuck in my mind, I was stuck in my thoughts, I was stuck in my feelings, and I just, I saw the Lord saying, just open your eyes, Cassie, just open your eyes and see me. And so, in my mind's eye, like, not actually opening my eyes, I saw this picture of a tornado swirling around me, but it was the Lord. It wasn't something scary or bad, it was the Lord. And as it was swirling around, the Lord was like, see what I'm doing. Don't look at what the enemy's doing. Don't look at what's inside of you. Look what I'm doing. And as I began to raise my arms and worship in the Lord, I was rising up. And it picked me up off the ground. And it brought me above what, what was going on in, in me, the not good stuff. And the Lord says, open your eyes and see what I'm doing. Allow me to raise you up with wings like eagles above. He rises us above what we're going through, above the physical stuff, the flesh stuff. Yes. I feel like there are people in here just like me who are stuck in, in the thoughts. They're stuck in the feelings, and the Lord is saying, allow me to rise you up. It's not by our strength. It's not by our might. It's not by anything that we do. It's the Lord that raises us up. And as we worship and as we praise Him and as we look 
presence is pregnant in this room. Just reach up. Just reach up and take what you need. Take what you need from your heavenly Father. <coughs> Yeah, bow your heads, you're able to sit if you want to sit. 
just going to have, uh, we're going to do that. We're just going to lean in, lean in to prayer. Holy Spirit, we come right in and ask that you would just reveal oh, that thing. Each of us know what that thing is that we need to repent. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for loving us through that journey. You're so patient. You're so kind. Yet you prepare us. You prepare us for the seasons of our lives. God, we ask that you would just continue speaking today. Holy Spirit, come, speak your truth today. Go to those deep places that only you can go. So 
chew on and, and surrender. We've all got places that, that need surrender. Uh, believe in God for transformation. Not just, not just a shift in a thought, but transformation.
is because when the Holy Spirit begins to do things that are outside of our expectation, it usually happens in the context of us kind of, it's almost like, okay, are, are you ready for me to speak now? <laughs> Right, you know, in prayer, you know, we go in and prayer, we're going after Lord, I need this, I need this, we need this to happen, all right, Lord. And then he's like, okay, are you finished? And we sit and we wait for the Lord. There is so much principle in the Psalms, even, of waiting on the Lord. And so as we learn how to linger, we're waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Spirit of God to speak to us. And he can say something very different to each and every one of us in the room. And that's okay. That's welcome, right? Uh, and so we just want to get, because even in your prayer time, learning to sit and listen for his voice, even more so than our own. <laughs> and he's sitting and praying in the Spirit. Let him encourage you. And, you know, in those moments, you may not even know what. He's saying for now, but he, he will reveal it later. And uh, when you need him most in those moments. So, yeah, we just, I appreciate it. That's what I'm trying to say. So I appreciate you guys leaning in on this. All right. Well, start with a little law enforcement humor for anybody in the room. Anybody, any, any former or current law enforcement people in the room at all? Former, yes, yeah. Yeah, all right, all right, yes, very good. Yeah, well, this, then you'll, you'll appreciate this very much, all right. So, to test their skills, these newbies, in recognizing a suspect, the officer shows the trainees a picture uh, and then hides it. He showed it for five seconds and then hides it. He says, this is your suspect. How would you recognize him? So the first guy answers and says, well, that's easy. We'll catch him fast because he only has one eye. Well, the policeman says, well, uh, that's because the picture I showed is of his side profile. All right? So slightly flustered, the officer Said, you know, by the, he, he's very flustered by this ridiculous response, obviously. So he flashes the picture for five seconds at the second guy. And he says, this is your suspect. How would you recognize him? Well, the second guy smiles, flips his hair, and says, huh, he'd be too easy to catch because he only has one ear. Well, the policeman angrily responds, what's the matter with you two? Of course, there's only one eye and one ear because it's a picture of his side profile. Is that the best answer you can come up with? Well, extremely frustrated by this point, the police officer shows the picture to the third guy and in a very testy voice asks, this is your suspect, how would you recognize him? And he quickly adds, think hard before giving me a stupid answer, all right? The third guy looks at the picture intently for a moment and says, well, the suspect wears contact lenses. The policeman is surprised and speechless because he really doesn't know himself if the suspect wears contacts or not. Well, that's an interesting answer. Well, wait here for a few minute, minutes while I check his file, and I'll get back to you on that. Well, he leaves the room, goes to the office, checks the suspect's file, and sure enough, he says, wow, I can't believe it. It's true. The suspect does, in fact, wear contact lenses. Good work. How are you able to make such an astute observation? Well, the third guy said, well, that's easy. He can't wear regular glasses because he's only got one eye and one ear. <laughs> oh, my. They went to the Roscoe B. Coltrane School of Officer, you know, a police academy, right? Yes. All right. How many of us in the room today have ever played any organized sports? Any sport of any kind? That's a great majority in the room. All right. Now, how many of you didn't get to play but you wanted to? That's okay, too. Yeah, there's a few of us. Yeah. Uh, see, growing up, I loved football 
baseball and basketball. And I played Little League baseball for like six years. I played football for, I guess, about three, and basketball I played a couple of years. Now, I was constantly playing one of those three sports. Even if it, it wasn't through organized rec leagues, it was just in the front yard with neighborhood friends, right? I mean, I loved playing them so much that I would even play them by myself, imagining I was the star player on the team. Anybody else in the room, right? Yes, this was me. I would act like I was Roger Staubach and Tony Dorsett for the Dallas Cowboys, right? Or, you know, Razorback players, basketball players, like Alvin Robertson, Daryl Walker, you know, those guys. Yeah, I know Mike Seals knows what I'm talking about. Now, and I would even imagine myself, now this is going to be a stretch if anybody knows these names in this room. I would imagine myself as Buddy Bell, Jim Sundberg, or Larry Parrish for the Texas Rangers, all right? Did anybody even know those names at all? I know, right? Yes, all right, yes. There's a few of us in the room. All right, so now, yeah, those are some old school names. I was just, yeah, uh, but I was those people, all right, when I was playing, imaginary playing in my front yard or whoever we were playing. Well, whichever sport it was, when I was a kid, I would either play like I was then, or I would insert myself into the starting lineup. So, caveat for our students and young adults, this is what you did when there was no video games or, you know, electronic devices. You had to get creative, all right? This is just, yeah, you know, it's just free of charge for you, all right? So, this is how we spend our time. I would imagine myself coming up the bat with the bases loaded, two outs, down by three runs, and yes, you guessed it, the team needed me to hit the grand slam, right, to win the game in the bottom of the ninth, no less. Or Roger Staubach would strategically get hurt, and Tom Landry would ask me, the quarterback, the winning drive against the Washington Redskins. Yes. I would imagine myself, just like anybody, any other kid, dreaming and imagining success and winning the big game. Now, if you've heard a few, a few professional athletes that, who have actually experienced this type of you know, dream in real life, like they really won the game by the last swing or shooting the last second winning basket or scoring the winning TD, you know, during the interviews, they would often refer to playing through in their mind as a kid the same scenario. And they said, I prepared for this moment all my life, which is probably a true statement, right? What we imagine can influence our physiological outcome. Have you ever thought about it? Imagination is a God-given, <laughs> God-created characteristic. Now, I won't unpack all this today. And I, 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 Quinn and I, Quinn mentioned the other day, I guess it's been a couple of weeks ago, to see and kind of thought about the imagination part. So when I started off on this, I was like, man, maybe we, I mean, this was yesterday. I was going, man, we could tag team something about imagination. It would be really, really awesome. And so we may come back and do something like that or maybe just have her you know, speak on whatever. But the, way, the reason I'm using imagination today is uh, you'll see kind of where we're going. But... <coughs> How many golfers are in the room? Yeah, the other, yeah. So, when you're playing golf, you imagine yourself swinging the perfect swing. Strikes the ball straight and long, right down the fairway. What about golfers when, you know, you see them on TV when they're on the green and they're getting ready to putt. They're walking all around the green. They're looking at all these different angles right there. See it. They're imagining the path that their ball must take and go in the hole, okay? And then they line up and then hit the ball, hit the ball with appropriate power and velocity, right? We imagine ourselves doing tasks with success. And if our focus is on failure, well, guess what you're going to get? Failure, right? Now, our imaginations can greatly influence us physiologically to the point that it affects our physical performance. Now, God created us with imagination, okay? He created us with this because 
It's in this same place in our minds that faith in God originates. Think about that. It's the God-given ability called faith to see something in the spirit that is not yet there in the natural. If we are going to believe in something or see something before it exists, it originates in that same place as our imagination. And in, in, most, case, in, in most cases, when, it's, when you're talking about faith, you're, you're talking about the spirit of God giving you a vision of being able to see it before it comes to existence in the natural. That is what faith is, what the Bible describes it. So we have a choice to see that or not. So if God created our imaginations to have such a powerful physiological effect upon our physical being, is it possible that our imaginations can be where our faith in seeing healing originates? However, if we allow our imagination without faith in God to drive us, man, it can run wild, allowing our imagination to kind of humanistically dictate our reality. And at that point, what we do, we just idolize ourselves or another voice and are working in agreement and alignment with the enemy's assignment on our lives to lure us away from God and faith all oh, yeah. Now, our imagination must be tamed just like our emotions. It's still from that soulish region of our mind, will, and emotion. All of that has to come under the submission of the spirit. But just like our emotions, it needs to be tamed by the truth of God, or it can craftily lead us astray if not wrapped in the truth of God. Everybody tracking that? All right, so Pastor Chad Gonzalez, I, uh, he was on uh, Sid Roth, and I saw this clip, and I thought, man, this is really interesting to me. Uh, Pastor Chad Gonzalez visited with a former witch doctor, and this former witch doctor has since professed Jesus as Lord. And he, this former witch doctor just had some great insight into the heavenly realm of healing, and the power of our words. So I'd like for us to take a look at this. We've got two clips. One I'll show, uh, and then we'll come back to it later. I know the second clip later. But here's the first clip. She burned from there. Well, I wanted to, to talk to these, these different guys because it was from a standpoint I knew that, in one sense, they were having greater spiritual experiences than most Christians. Not me, it was demonic, but operating in a very real power. And and this was a former witch doctor, and, and so I told him, I said, talk, talk to me about like, meditation and the power of our words and, and healing. And he said, well, when it comes to healing, he said, you have to understand that all sickness and disease is of the devil. And I said, well, yeah, I understand that. It's pretty cool for a witch doctor to be saying that a former witch doctor to go ahead. And he said, number two, he said, uh, all disease, sickness and disease, he said it's a spiritual thing. He said, when we look at, you know, most people look at it as a physical thing. He said it's spiritual. It's a spiritual thing. Well, most Christians they still think it's a physical thing. He said it's spiritual. And he said that's why when people would come to us, he said we couldn't take away the disease. He said Satan isn't a creator. He said we couldn't take it away, but we would manipulate it. He said we would change it like it came to us with cancer. We would just change it to diabetes. How'd you like to go to a doctor like that? <laughs> he said we would just manipulate it. And he said the third thing is, he said this, he said Satan cannot make a Christian sick unless a Christian gives him the authority that God gave them. Why would a Christian do that? Well, so no Christian would purposely say, hey, devil, make me sick. Nobody's going to do that. But what, the way Satan operates is he brings these thoughts, these ideas, and these suggestions. So he's a deceiver. He's, he's, he's a liar. And so I, we have dominion over him. So the only way he can have authority is if we give it to him. He's been doing this since the Garden of Eden. This is what we did to Eve. It was great deception. And it's been going on for all these years. He only can operate as a counterfeit artist. That's it. That's it. He went to him. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I mean, Satan 
brings thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. You know, the old uh, flip, hey, you turn the lights back on just for a minute. Oh, there we go. Um, the idea that, um, the, you know, the old Flip Wilson phrase, the devil made me do it. It's not true. The devil never makes us do anything. It's, so under the same concept that, and we, we kind of talked about this the other night in our young adult group. Nobody makes us mad or angry. Yeah, they do things that we have the opportunity to be angry or mad about. But if we have no choice in that, then, man, we're just letting our flesh to do what, and that's what the world wants us to believe. That's why, even in our identity, if someone says, well, I, I feel this way, and I'm acting, my body wants to be this way, then I must be this. Right, catching me? Yep. So, if, if we don't have a choice, then we're just relegated to what our flesh wants to do. But what he's saying is, is that the enemy offers us those thoughts and suggestions and ideas, and he's the deceiver. And we have the choice to believe the lie or believe the word of God to be true. That's right. If he can get us believing the lie about ourselves and really speaking death over ourselves, then he has the inroad to wreak havoc on our lives. Because we've actually given him that power. Because we've given him our ear. And it starts in our mind. Right? Battle in our mind. So today's sermon title is, I Imagine So. Part of the vision here at New Day is to equip all of us as believers to recognize the Spirit's voice and his assignment for us to walk in Normal Christianity by leaning into supernatural encounters with God obediently. Okay, now uh, we desire to equip believers to be ready for those divine encounters. That's my heart for you. That's our heart as leadership over this house. We want us to all be ready for those divine encounters that the Holy Spirit is already leading us into. That allows us to communicate the love of God through His power working through us, through miracles, signs, and wonders. Just like Jesus did. It's it, 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 we're not running after manifestations just because we want to be enamored with miracles, signs, and wonders. We simply desire to walk in normal Christianity. This is what normal Christianity is in the Word of God. And it's by the example that Jesus set for the disciples and the disciples have set for us in sharing the love of God. Jesus said we would, through the power of the Spirit, do as He did and even to a greater degree. Let's look at it. John 14, 12. Very very popular verse in this house. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. This is Jesus talking. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. And, I mean, it's almost like you guys think this is impressive. Y'all haven't seen nothing yet. When I send the Spirit to empower you and you're surrendered to me, you're going to see even greater stuff than this. Okay? So to actually walk ready to minister in the supernatural, we first need to own in our minds that this is true. I mean, if we don't believe that it's possible or that God operates this way, then we will not see him move this way through us. I mean, this has been the modern church for decades in many denominations, and we wonder why people are leaving the church in droves as they experience dead religion that's a lot of talk and no power. And we're transitioning in this house from all that. And I, I mean, want to see more, but not because we want to see cool stuff. Okay? 
We want to be able to share the love of God, the authentic Jesus, the authentic movement of the Holy Spirit. We're not trying to concoct something. That's right. We just want to see Him use us to move and be the what the church in Acts was now, in this day, because He promised it. I don't want to miss that. The Bible says the kingdom of God is within us and that the kingdom of God is not of talk but of power. So in this house, we are believing the word to be true. Yeah. And secondly, we, we then need to imagine ourselves being used of God to minister his love to people this way. If you don't really believe that walking in the supernatural power of God is true, then it's going to be pretty hard to see that fruit manifest in your life. If, if you somehow see yourself as less than and not equipped to minister God's love in this way, then you will not see this fruit in your life. We must begin to walk in this faith in that the word of God is true. This is the kingdom of God at work in us and through us. Colossians 3.2 To set your mind on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. Mark 11.24 Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Romans 12.2 do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, we don't like that part usually, but by, that by testing we may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Or in other words, the perfect is mature. 2 Timothy 1.7 for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and of sound mind. You know, we either respond to circumstances in our life out of fear or out of faith. There is a, there are a few moments that both coexist. Just a few moments. We get until we really make that decision of how we're going to respond. We're met with them. Like, which one am I going to choose? Out of fear, I might choose something to hurt somebody else because they wronged me. Not because we fear being hurt. Whereas faith comes in, but what they said doesn't really make it to my ear that deep because I'm like, hey, God's already told me who I am. I don't have to get all jacked up about what they think about it. Okay? Because I know who I am in Christ. So my response is not a spirit of fear, it's one of faith. If, if the spirit of fear is present, it becomes that choice that we make then, the spirit of power and love and sound mind are not there. Because we're making decisions out of flesh and not out of faith. All right, so we're going to watch another couple of minutes of this interview with Chad Gonzalez. Um, and I want you to notice what even the witch doctor would do in, you know, sacrificing himself to put curses on other people, right? This former witch doctor, I should say. You were telling me when that former witch doctor was a witch doctor what he would do and the price he would pay to put his curses on people. Explain that. He said before he would put a curse on someone, he said I would get up early, early in the morning before the sun would rise. He said I have a chair I would take outside of my house so everyone would leave me alone. He said I would go to that chair and I would sit in that chair. He said I would not leave that chair until I knew that the curse I was going to pronounce that day was going to come to pass. So he would go out there and he would meditate and use his imagination, see himself pronouncing that curse, see that curse coming to pass, whether it was on a village, you know, a town, a person, a pastor, a church. He said, I would not leave my chair until I knew it. He said, then when the sun would come up, I'd make a covenant with the sun. 
It was a powerful thing that he said. He said, I'll look at the sun rising. And he said, I'll say to the sun, if nothing in this world can keep you from rising, nothing in this world will keep my words from coming to pass. And at that moment, I realized th these witch doctors have more faith, in a sense, than most of the Christians that I know. Because he would leave that place and he would go out and pronounce a curse. And he wasn't going around and confessing and confessing and confessing it. And I believe I received and I believe I received and I believe it was one time. Because he already saw it here. It was conceived here. And then through his words, he birthed it that one time. Chad, I've wondered, what happens if a witch doctor puts a curse on a spirit-filled Christian? He told me, he said, I could only do something to a Christian if they didn't know who they were. We're, we're in a sense, dead men walking. We're dead to sin, dead to sickness, dead to disease. But this is why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, but now you need to consider yourself to be dead to sin. See, it shows the redemptive reality is I'm dead to sin. And if I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to all of the results of sin. Sin is the, is the root. And sickness and disease, it's the fruits. Sin is the, is the source. Sickness, disease, poverty, lack, those are the byproducts. If I'm dead to the source, I'm dead to the, the byproducts as well. But Paul said, even though this is a, a spiritual reality, you need to consider it to be true. Otherwise, again, you can be saved in spirit, but if you have cursed thinking, you're still going to get cursed results, wow. even though Jesus sets you free. Yeah. When we return, I will... Yeah, right? I think in that, it's pretty powerful. Two things really stuck out to me. One, you know, that we need to have more faith in the witch doctor. <laughs> would have the other one, right? I mean, what the sacrifices that they would do in an imagination, demonic realm is, is absolutely, obviously, it's real. So if some of you are just struggling with that, well, welcome to the party, you know? But if, if we can understand, if this is the way the heavenly realm works, then guess where our faith needs to begin? At least at that much, right? But with God, because he said, I crushed Satan's head. So it's it's not that we have to fear any of that. We don't have to we don't have to dwell on the fact that the demonic's got power because we've got the, the powerful sword. Right, he's already he's already made that dead. Okay. And another thought was, man, how hungry. For God and His movement, are we? I mean, to to sit and go. I mean, we've talked about this before. To actually read the Word long enough that the Holy Spirit breaks through in what we're reading. To spend time with Him long enough that the actual Spirit of God begins to penetrate, not just a routine action, but a a, a, a communing spirit. Where it means something. And then the, the last thing that I kind of took from this is what are we advocating in what we say or believe? What are we advocating? And that word means you know, what are we giving into? What are we giving up to the enemy by simply saying the things we do? Let's go to Mark chapter 9, verse 17. It says, Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. All right, at some point right here in the story, all of us, you know, there would be many of us who are like, uh, peace out. I'm out of the this guy's phone at the mouth, blocking the floor. Maybe you would be uncomfortable in that situation. But this man says, so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said, O oh, faithless, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. He fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. 
Verse 21. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. And often the spirit has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you, Jesus, can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, understand what he just asked and how he asked it. Because here's Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. But he didn't stop there. What did he say? Help my unbelief. See, even the father recognized what his question was. Because he was saying, Jesus, if, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus wanted to clarify, do you believe that I can do? says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead. So the many said, he is dead. <laughs> but Jesus just took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. One, this epileptic seizure he was being seized by this spirit. I mean, let's call that for what it is. Epilepsy is a demonic manifestation. Now, it's not that you got to go looking for a demon on every doorknob. Okay? It's not what I'm suggesting here. Because there are physiological things that happen, but as we can understand, even the witch doctors understand that sickness and disease are the enemy's ploy to come against you and your body. Yep. Now, he said some deliverance comes by prayer and fasting. We just want to be prepared in walking a walk that incorporates fasting. Especially, you especially, you know, being an intercessor or, you know, you got prayer over your house. You know, you want to have prayer over your house and over your family. Fasting it can, can be a regular part of that. That would, would allow you to understand the authority that you already have in Christ. Okay? We're just aligning with Him, all right? I think most of us in the room today would agree that maybe uh, the biggest couple of hindrances to just diving in wholeheartedly to the idea of praying over someone for healing is, one, what if the person doesn't get healed? Right? That's the big question, right? And then two, maybe you had your own issue of not being healed, and so what do I do with that, Paul? I think there are some things we need to understand. First of all, Jesus can change our circumstances in a moment by healing a sickness or a disease in us. But what he really desires for us is to for us to experience sozo healing, is what it's called. It's, it's the complete and total transformation of us. Not just our situation, our circumstance, or our sickness. I mean, he can make our physical situation better in any moment. And because it's inconvenient at the time, we were like, God, this would be a really great time for you to change this, right? And when he does it, then we get mad or we get kind of like, oh. But then even in that, there's endurance. There's perseverance. There's travailing 
before the Lord. <clears throat> In praying over someone else, we really need to just be listening to the Spirit regarding people. Whether it's a word of knowledge or a prophecy or hearing that a person is experiencing back pain or if they've been diagnosed with cancer, I mean, it all still, we all need to be listening for the Spirit and His instruction. In all instances, if we're not listening to the Spirit, then it gets too easy for it to become about us. And we know that because we're like, right there on the edge, okay, Lord, well, if, they, well, if they're not healed, then I'm going to look like an idiot. You see how that worked? <laughs> like, right back to us, right? Either we heard the Spirit pray, tell us to pray, in faith, or we're kind of worried about what we might look like. Or you can get into, you know, how many healings we performed. And it was my prayer that I should do the healing, right? This is, I mean, these are very common thoughts that we have to fight and take captive. We have to leave them at Jesus' feet, right? It's for His glory, not ours. But that doesn't mean that we need to not lean into the Spirit's promptings for people. <laughs> Can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Remember, God wants to communicate His love through us. Not just a cool supernatural moment. He wants to communicate His love through us. This is one way that he does it, that really gets their spiritual attention. I mean, look how Jesus operated, right? He healed their physical ailments and spoke words of knowledge to them for them to see his supernatural work that allowed faith to rise up within them so that they could begin to lay down their lives and trust him. He still works like that today. Just because some of us don't believe that doesn't mean he's not doing it. You know, a supernatural encounter, quote unquote, can be as simple as hearing the Spirit's prompting to go pray for someone. Or as the Holy Spirit highlights them to, he wants you to tell them how much Jesus loves them. And he notices them. Man, you've ever done that. The looks on their faces. It's one of two ways, right? <laughs> They're looking at you like, uh, you crazy. Now, yeah, I know. Just chalk it up. Thank you, Lord. Right? I mean, you're just, that one was for you. <laughs> Sometimes those moments are for others. Sometimes they're for you. <clears throat> He's testing us. See, are, are you really in this for me? So we may not see what we're expecting to see. But that doesn't mean he's not working. That doesn't mean he can't do it, for sure. It just means he's growing us. Testing our, testing our genuineness. We can simply communicate God's love by praying for someone. Or you can go all the way to these faith-stretching moments of seeing cancer healed or Resurrection prayer over someone who's flatlined. Supernatural, divine encounters are orchestrated by God and for God to reveal His love for that person. It shouldn't be about you at all. If the Holy Spirit has prompted you, then He's simply reminding you that you are already equipped to do it and highlighting the person that He's drawing to Himself. And all we've done is we've said, I'm available, use me. And then we walk through that process of really dying to self for him to use us. So, why does sickness and disease even exist? This is a massive question, and I'm not going to do this justice, really. But I'm going to tackle a little bit of it, just from a, a bigger view. 
First of all, if you're going to pray over anybody, or even if you're experiencing any kind of sickness, and disease, man, go to God first. All right? Go to Him first. And God can do it both ways. You know, we know that He heals, but we know that He can heal it supernaturally. He can also heal it through the doctors. He can do it both ways. Okay? So we're not here declaring that, you know, going to doctors are bad. Not at all. All right? And you know, Gary Parker, Dr. Gary Parker, who is, you know, champion for the Lord, love that brother in Christ. He's a doctor. <laughs> and one of the first things he does is pray over people before he even gets, goes anywhere else in the, in the church, right? I have to find that at the BD exam, okay? So go to God first. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what needs to be prayed for. Is there anything there we need to address? We just don't need to, we don't have to go around claiming sickness and disease as our identity. My diabetes, my high blood pressure, my cancer. That's right, that's right. I mean, come on. Sin, or sickness and disease exist because, come on, the present state of sin dwelling in the earth. Okay? The earth is groaning for its return, for the return of Jesus for a reason. Because when Jesus comes back, he restores all things. Because things are off. Sin has caused everything to be off. The second reason it exists is maybe it's a consequence of sin in our lives. And it can be Everything from practical to there are maybe some spiritual things going on. Practical part is if, you know, we eat 12 McDonald's cheeseburgers a day for two years, you may have some health problems. <laughs> and that was for me. <laughs> maybe partly confessing. I don't know. <laughs> going, no, no, don't tell you. Don't tell you. I mean, we, there are some things that we can do in the natural that influence our health. But some of the spiritual aspects of that can be just what we were talking about earlier. Are there things that the enemy, that we are believing, that are a lie about us, that we are kind of owning, that doesn't need to be there? That the enemy's got a little crack in the door. To mess with us. Some things can be in the natural, but also some things can be very spiritual. But go to God first. Let the Holy Spirit reveal that to you. Okay? Or allow Him to speak through other people to help, help you see it. John chapter 5, verse 11. <coughs> Excuse me. But He answered him, The man who healed me. That man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And the Pharisees asked him, well, who is this man who said to, to, to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. Like, yeah, that's, that's really kind of funny. I'm not going to go there. Put my brain to turn around and say it. All right. As there was a crowd in the place, all right? Just kind of boom, heal out of it, right? After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. That's curious, right? Sin can play a part. Doesn't mean it's always that. Just because we're just because we experience disease or sickness doesn't always mean that it was sin. In our law, okay? You don't hear what I'm not saying. But it can be. That's why we go to God first. Ask the Spirit's direction. Let's go to James chapter 5, 14 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. 
and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Unforgiveness and, and, and stuff that we're hanging on to may also contribute. Okay? Again, we're not putting a formula around anything. We're saying these are things that we need to think about. And go to God first. Ask the Spirit for direction. Okay? Because the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Praise God. The next, the next thing I have, sickness and, and disease exist as assignments of the enemy. That's right. And we're very, we're very Job popular reference with that. But the assignments of the enemy are there to get us to walk away from our faith. That's pretty self-explanatory. We get weary, we get tired, we want, you know, and I'm not here to tell you that you've got all the answers to why someone's not healed. Don't know. That's way above my pay grade. Let me just tell you. We don't know. Sometimes, sometimes there's so many factors that come into. But we do know that we can pray in faith and God, God's going to do what he's going to do. Okay? And we, we need to, as we understand better how his kingdom works, then we, have, we can apply those to those areas faith yeah. and see movement. And another reason uh, that sickness and disease exists is for God to make himself known. Man, we, most of us don't want to be in that line. <laughs> You're like, yes, Lord, I want you to be known. Okay, bro. it's going to be through this sickness, right? Now, now, some of you are like, well, God doesn't make people sick. Well, hang on, okay? Again, we know that the enemy loves to attack our bodies through sickness and disease, okay? But it doesn't mean what the enemy meant for evil that God can use for good, right? He, that, that he does that all day, every day. Okay, so it, in uh, Exodus 9, 15 through 16, I don't have these up on the I'm just kind of uh, blowing through these a little bit. It says, for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. It was in Exodus where they applied, I mean, the Israelites got, I mean, there was a plague. You know, God put a you know, plague on them. Because he wanted, to, he, he wanted his name to be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, uh, John chapter 9 Verses 1 through 3. And some of you will probably be thinking of this passage when I'm speaking a while ago about this. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, here's what I want to say. Most of us read that as prescriptive. What I mean by that is you apply that thought to every situation. So if we've already seen an example where sin did actually play a part in somebody's physical you know, physical uh, sickness and disease. So which one is it? Well, we have to see this as an understanding that in this situation, it's what Jesus was talking about, in this situation, it had nothing to do with this man's sin. It didn't have anything to do with his parents' sin. But the reason why the disciples asked him about it was because that actually does exist. And they knew that principle. So they were asking, what about this? He's like, no, this wasn't about sin. It was about, I'm just showing off. <laughs> right? but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So some of us may wonder, man, why am I walking through this? And it's been so long. Why, why am I not healed? Why, 
I'm experiencing this hard. It's so hard. He wants us to display the mighty works of God. Our faithful walk with Him when things don't go the way we expect. Stay faithful to it. And then another, sometimes, sometimes sickness and disease exist for reasons of God's judgment. Again, this is not the blanket of how he works all the time, but sometimes, we've seen the scripture that sometimes there are reasons of God's judgment. Exodus 15, 26 says, if you give ear to my commands, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. I am your healer. So, I mean, he did this to the Egyptians. Now, obviously, we're not following the Lord. And he said, hey, if you don't follow the Lord, you're going to end up like this. Revelation 2, 21 through 22, he's talking to the church at Thyatira. And he said, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. That's pretty straight up. So there are some times for reasons of God's judgment. Okay? Again, it's not a blanket formula to apply every time somebody's sick. You know, all God's judging you. I don't even I don't even think the pandemic was that. God was getting our attention as the church. I think it was just because, man, the enemies at work, so the Antichrist spirit is alive and well. Matthew 24, he said, hey, this is going to happen. And so we saw some of that. Then the last reason that sickness and disease may exist is for multiple reasons. <laughs> Natural consequences, maybe judgment. I mean, Romans 1 26 through 27. It says, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, Experiencing the consequences of sin in our bodies when we do not listen or follow the Lord. That is every day, real life. And I, I would venture to imagine, you know, venture to guess that even in our culture, these passages, this passage of Scripture, you're going to find statistic after statistic depression, suicide. All up in this group. Now, the world wants to wants to say that it's because of outside pressure, but we have all experienced depression before in certain ways. Maybe not say we all we all. If any of you have experienced depression at any point in your life, there are factors that we get to respond to. Does it mean that it has to do with so many external factors? It can be just maybe we've owned something of some stinking thinking. And that we might believe the lie that the enemy is, is telling us that causes whatever anger is in there that's turned inward. And we don't want to talk about it. And it messes with us. The enemy uses it. And it's the same principle here. It's not about how, what everybody else has done. It's how, how we respond. Okay? And what he's saying here, this is, this is so, I mean, this right here begins to shed light on what is happening inside to this group of people. And so, having compassion on them, yes. Absolutely. But we also understand what's happening what the enemy loves to do in bring using sin to kill, 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 steal, and destroy. Q. 
keep in the show. Yeah, it's there. Okay. All right. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. I always have to think about that when I say it. And it's like, kill, steal in the show. Yeah, okay. 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 25. Now, there's also something said about suffering. I want us to touch on this because suffering and the complete reliance upon God. I mean, Peter quotes Isaiah 53, 5 in this passage here. It says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle ones, but also to the harsh. Somebody say, oh me, right? Have you ever had a bad boss right here? This is for you. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongly. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore his sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died in sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes were you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Suffering has a space in God's kingdom. Some things we must endure because of what it is producing in us. So that's where all the health, wealth, gospel stuff goes astray. Really bad. Because there is something about, I mean, even that doesn't even apply to Jesus himself, right? I mean, going down the Via Della Rosa did not seem very prosperous at the time. Nor, you know, health. God wants us healthy. He created us for victory. And we operate from that place. But we're going to operate from that place while going through some stuff. I can only imagine him walking down the Via Della Rosa for the mission that was ahead of him to save the world and having to, in his humanity, he wasn't applying his godness here, by the way. That's right. With, when the cat of nine tails was striking him, when he was struggling to bring the cross up the Via he was every bit human. And he had to find it within himself, within himself, the endurance to make it through the suffering, to persevere. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we need that. We need that kind of endurance in the days ahead. If, if, we, if we think that Christianity is just going to solve all of our circumstantial stuff, then we're going to walk away from our faith. Because you're going to be so disappointed. You were sold a bill of goods. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a spot, there's a space for suffering in the kingdom. Because in, within suffering, we be, if we're responding correctly, we are desperately laying ourselves down and relying upon God moment by moment. And that's where he wants us. The reality is, if we don't go through those things, it becomes way too easy to rely upon ourselves. So we daily die to our expectations. We daily die to what we really want to tell that boss. Or that, I mean, even... Even people that have led churches in your background that burned you. You can still honor God with somebody who's not doing the right thing. 
to endure. Obediently endure. And then he brings to life. And then raises you up or raises whatever situation to life. And then he gets the honor and glory. Matthew chapter 10, and then we'll land here. And he called to them, his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. That's his heart for you. He's not, he's not trying to withhold who he is. Or, he's a good father. But how many of you know a good parent sometimes allows us to go through things that are preparing us for that next season? If we just pray and it's instantly changed every time, then we as humanity love to make a formula out of that. <laughs> you know, okay, Daddy, take me out of this. You know, I mean, moves us every time. Then we don't learn how to endure. Then when things don't go our way, we have the tendency, could have the tendency to just abandon our Times are going to get too hard for that. Okay? Three thoughts and we'll be done. Heaven touches earth through faith in the kingdom of God operating in us and through us. Heaven touching earth. That's what all the supernatural movement is. We are listening for him and in faith allowing that connection to take place through us and in us. We don't have to. We can just die. I don't want any part of it. He gives you free will over it. But if we are operating in his kingdom, if the kingdom of God is within us and we are we have said yes to him and we are full of the Spirit, wanting to be used of Him to do what we were created to do, then this is how we operate. This is how the kingdom of God comes on earth before Jesus comes back to restore all things. Second thought. Just like we can be set free from strongholds and not deal with slave mindsets we talked about last week, that allow them to be set up and, and they can be, you know, we can get delivered and they can return if we go back to this slave mindset. We start owning the lie again. This can happen with healing. As we receive our healing from him, you know, we've seen supernatural healing take place. If for some reason the enemy tries to challenge that, which happens, and we go, nope, this has already been taken care of. It's just the test. It's the test to see, hey, how much do you believe that I'm moving in you? How much do you, how much do you believe that you are healed? Walking in and under both God's sovereign authority and the authority of truth, which is like everyday reality, allows us to see heaven touching earth through supernatural movement. The last thing, let's walk ready to minister with a faith in the God of impossible. Can we do that around here? We just believe that, you know, might be crazy enough to believe he's the God of the gospel. Right? Why? Because the word said he is. And we're seeing those things take place more and more. And as faith rises up in this house, we will see more manifestations of that. But it's to love on this region. With the love of Christ. It's not about new days. It's not about how 
Man, they had 42 humans out here at midday last week. What do y'all got? You know? No. It's not about that. It's about the love of Christ. And I went there and I experienced the love of God like I've never experienced before. The presence of God. We want to be good hosts of His presence in this house. It requires faith. All right, why don't you stand with me? That's the one from play. So where is your faith today? Is your thought pattern, is it an on earth as it is in heaven approach? Or is it, have you, have you have more faith in natural things than faith in God to do than in the supernatural? If that's the case today, then we would proceed to repent. Why? Not, not because it's this harsh judgment or this, you know, oh, you have sinned. It's, yeah, we want to repent of those things that don't line up with God's truth for us. Now, anything that we are owning or that we're walking in that may not align with what the truth of God is, man, yeah, we just need to repent and go, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for believing the lie of the enemy about this. You can name it, whatever. Maybe it's a simple prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the example that you gave for the blood that you shed. You said on the cross that it is finished. It is finished. By your stripes we are healed. You have already done it. You've completed everything, the requirement that would allow us to operate this way. And all you're saying is we embrace you as our Lord and Savior. You give us the resurrection power, the Spirit of God living within us. And then we walk this journey of allowing that Spirit of God to overtake and overwhelm our soulish, physical being. So Lord, today we just want to Continue with that thought we were praying earlier of surrendering to you. It's not so much in chasing after manifestations. And, but you did say hunger or pursue earnestly the gifts of God, the gift of the spirit, the spiritual gifts of you. We do want to earnestly seek you. And in earnestly seeking you, then you empower us to do everything that you created us to do. You meet us right where we're at. Even if it's something as simple as stopping in, in the middle of a store or at the gas station and just, or at a restaurant just praying for someone. And then we see you move. And then out of that, our faith begins to build more. trust you. Help us pass the tests. Genuineness of our faith. The endurance of suffering. That you may be honored and glorified. So Lord, we want to die to ourselves today. Yet again, if this is you, church, this is just right there where you are. Just 
Lord, I am dying to myself again today. I need you. Crucify this old flesh. Keep the dead man dead. Keep the old creature in the ground. Because, Lord, you have made me alive in you. And I want to learn how to operate more and more in that. So, I, Lord, I surrender. I ask that you just come. And we love you more. Holy Spirit, lead and guide us this week. Help us just hear your still small voice, those promptings in those moments, those divine encounters, Lord, that you are bringing before us. Maybe somewhat teaching us, but Lord, ultimately it's for, for you to be able to communicate your love to that person that you are calling us to engage with in that divine encounter so that people experience the love of God they have a touch a supernatural touch that goes so deep in those places that neither one of you can explain it they just know that they've encountered something different and they want more of it why? because you placed them, you placed that within them more you placed it within all of us we, for us to desire more of you. So, Lord, we just lean into that today. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I hope the Holy Spirit spoke to you today. I hope you go and... And do likewise, right? Let's go and see what the Lord can do through us, through obediently walking with Him. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you.